It's good to be with you today for this week's online message from Kenmore Community Church. I'm Pastor Mark Rogers. I want to encourage you to have your Bible close by and open to Hebrews chapter 11, as we'll be continuing our study in the book of Hebrews today. Uh, this is also the first Sunday of the month, and so I encourage you to set aside some uh, communion elements so you can join me in the Lord's Supper at the end of my message today. That can be a, a small glass of juice, a small glass of wine, along with a small piece of bread or a cracker. Uh, but if you set those aside now, then you'll be able to join me in celebrating the Lord's Supper at the end of uh, my message. Let's begin our time together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and study your word, and we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is truth, that it speaks to us today, and um, we can learn from it and apply, uh, apply it to our lives, and we can uh, become more and more like Jesus in our thoughts, attitudes, and actions by living in obedience to your word. So we thank you for your word, and Lord, we thank you for your sovereign control over all things, for your infinite wisdom, your perfect love, and your unlimited power. And uh, Father, we uh, each of us come before you today with various concerns on our hearts and minds, and I pray that by your Holy Spirit you would minister to the needs of each person, that they would sense your presence and love and care and healing touch and your peace. And uh, Father, we know there's a lot going on in our world today that is also concerning to us, and we continue to pray for an end to the war between Ukraine and Russia, a just end to that war. We pray for an end to the war between Israel and Hamas, and, uh, and uh, pray that, uh, Lord, again, you would uh, guide and direct those uh, that are involved, that uh, peaceful, long-term solutions can be figured out in both of those conflicts. Here at Kenmore, we want to pray for our families of the week. We pray for Vicki Betts, for Cheryl Bowes, for Liz Bowes, and for Aaron from our youth group. We pray, Lord, for your blessing in their lives. We pray that uh, they would look to you and trust in you and turn to you and lean on you in whatever's going on in their life this week, and they would continue to find you faithful. And may uh, you give them opportunity to share the love of Christ with the people that are in their network of relationships. And we pray the same for ourselves, Lord, that you would lead us to the people you're drawing to Christ and help us to uh, be bold in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the people that uh, you bring across our path. Uh, we also want to pray for our mission focus today for the Timothy Initiative. We thank you for this organization that is uh, committed to advancing your kingdom by multiplying disciples and disciple-making churches around the world. We thank you that they're involved in many, many countries and uh, that their, um, uh, you know, their procedures seem to work well of training up disciples to make disciples. And thank you that we can be a part of that ministry and for just $400 a year we can plant a church. And so I pray that you'd help our church to be faithful in, uh, in following through with our commitment to plant 10 of these churches every year for the next couple years. Um, and so may, may our church be faithful in, in providing uh, those funds. And we pray for TTI that they'll be faithful in using those funds to help multiply churches and disciples uh, in uh, places around the world. Uh, we pray now as we come to studying your word here in Hebrews chapter 11, this great chapter on faith, that Lord, by your Holy Spirit, you would open our eyes and ears to hear and to see what you want to teach us today from your word and help us to uh, apply it in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, we're going to be uh, looking at Hebrews chapter 11 today, so I encourage you to open your Bibles to that chapter uh, the first ten and a half chapters of Hebrews that we have been studying have emphasized the superiority of Jesus Christ over everyone and everything, and in particular, the, the Old Covenant. Uh, Jesus is a superior high priest. He's offered a superior sacrifice in himself. He has, uh, he's serving in a superior sanctuary, a heavenly sanctuary as opposed to an earthly sanctuary. And he has mediated a, a better covenant, the new covenant, as opposed to the old covenant, the new covenant, uh, an unconditional covenant where God, through his Holy Spirit, has written his word on our minds and on our hearts and, and empowered us to live in obedience to his commands. And so uh, we have seen uh, all of this. And in, today, in today's uh, verses, uh, we're going to be looking at the first three verses of Hebrews chapter 11 as uh, we, we begin 
focusing again on these last three and a half chapters of Hebrews that are much more practical in nature. We got the theology in the first ten and a half chapters, but now uh, we're, we're beginning to apply. What does it mean that Jesus is our great high priest? How should that impact our lives? And so last week we talked about how we need to persevere in our faith because Jesus is our great high priest. And now uh, we do that by faith. The, the righteous shall live by faith. And uh, so uh, we're going to uh, be looking at this great chapter, Hebrews 11, which is all about faith. And it gives us many practical and concrete examples of the various aspects uh, of faith. So follow along as I read the first uh, three verses of Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So in this passage we discover the definition of faith, uh, and also what faith is based on, and we're encouraged then to live by faith. So let's talk about the definition of faith that we find in the first two chapters. First we see that faith is being sure of what we hope for. Now, the whole topic of faith is not uh, some brand new topic that the writer of Hebrews uh, just starts mentioning out of the blue here in chapter 11. He's been talking about faith for some time. Uh, He he addressed it in chapter 4, chapter 6, chapter 10, and he'll go on to say more about it in chapters uh, 12 and 13. However, most of his teaching on faith takes place right here in chapter 11. In fact, the word faith appears 31 times in the book of Hebrews. 24 of those are in chapter 11 alone. Uh, The most recent mention of faith before our chapter is found only a few verses before in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38. And I want us to take a moment to uh, look briefly at that verse because it helps us set the context for chapter 11. Hebrews 10.38 quotes an important verse in the Old Testament from the prophet Habakkuk, uh, Habakkuk 2.4, where he says, The righteous will live by faith. Now this verse from Habakkuk is central, uh, is a central verse to both the Old and the New uh, Testament. Paul quotes it in the book of Galatians and Romans as a key verse supporting the doctrine of salvation uh, by faith in Christ alone. And this, by the way, was the verse that Martin Luther discovered that led him to uh, rediscover the biblical doctrine of justification by faith and which launched the entire Reformation. So if you want to be righteous in God's eyes, then you need to live by faith. But what is faith? And that's the question that Hebrews chapter 11 is going to answer for us. So we see the first half of chapter 1. Uh, Faith is confidence in what we hope for, or being sure of uh, what we hope for. Uh, Those words, being sure, are a single word in the Greek. It's a word that literally means uh, that which goes underneath something that causes or makes it to stand. So it's what we would call a foundation or the uh, substructure uh, of, of something or a building. The stronger the foundation, the stronger the substructure it supports. Uh, the stronger the structure that it supports. So faith is the foundation in your life that keeps your hope alive, that keeps your hope from being shaken when trials come your way. The stronger your faith, the stronger the hope and your life. Uh, Think about in the news these days, we've heard a lot about the hurricanes and the tornadoes that are striking the South and the Midwest and uh, Uh, And if you're living in a trailer and you get word that a tornado's coming or a hurricane's coming, you better evacuate. You better get out of there because that trailer does not have much of a foundation. On the other hand, those homes that are built on a solid foundation, people can flee to the inner sanctum of that home, usually a bathroom, throw a mattress over themselves, and likely survive when that tornado or that hurricane hits. The walls, the roof may be come off, but you know the, the foundation of that house uh, remains uh, firm uh, and secure. And it's the same way with faith. Without faith, your confidence and hope will get tossed away as easily as a trailer in 150 mile per hour winds. Faith is the sure and strong foundation that gives you, gives you confidence or assurance concerning the things you hope for as a follower of Christ. Now, it's uh, a sure uh, confidence in what we hope for. So, uh, hope 
is uh, waiting with confidence and assurance, right? The word hope in uh, verse 1 is not a word that just means wishful thinking or hoping against hope. Like when someone asks you, do you think things will get better? And you say, well, I hope so. Uh, no, this word hope is the exact opposite of despair. It's a word that means to wait for something with confidence and assurance. The author of Hebrews has previously said that our hope in Christ is an anchor for our souls, firm and secure. So how do you keep a hope like that alive in your life? How do you keep your hope from being shaken? Hebrews 11.1 1 says you need a strong foundation. And you don't just pin your hopes up in the air and hope against hope that everything will turn out all right. That's not uh, genuine Christianity. Faith in Christ is the sure and strong foundation that gives you the confidence and assurance that you need. So that's the first part of our definition. Faith is being sure of what you hope for as a follower of Christ. The second part of the definition is that faith is being certain of what you do not see. Um, the word that is translated certain here is a word that, that, that means evidence or proof of conviction, and it comes from a word that means to convict or convince someone of the truth. And so it speaks of a deep, deep conviction or certainty in your heart. And then the word translated what in the phrase, certain of what you hope for and what you do not see, this is a word that means something that has been done or accomplished. It refers to matters or things that are factual or real. So what does this second half of our two-part definition of faith teach us? It teaches us that faith is a deep conviction in your heart concerning certain facts or realities that you cannot see. This is so important. True biblical faith is not faith in fantasies or things that are not true, but faith in realities which are unseen by human eyes. The New English Bible captures this thought perfectly uh, with its translation of this verse saying, faith makes us certain of realities that we do not see. So a couple of thoughts here uh, that we need to grasp from this part of the definition. If you can see it, then it's not faith, okay? First of all, um, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we live by faith, not by sight. Faith and sight are opposites in that, in that verse. So if you can see it, then it's not faith. Now, let me give you a few examples. For example, if you could see God, uh, then it would not take any faith to believe in him because you would actually see him. If you can see him, then it's not faith to believe in him because you, you can see him and, hey, it doesn't take any faith. He's there, okay? Uh, if uh, Another example, if I have an unexpected $500 uh, car repair bill and I have $10,000 of discretionary funds in my savings account, then it doesn't take any faith for me to be able to pay that car bill. Why? Because the money's already there and I can see it. And if I can see it, then it's not faith. Or how about if God asks you to do something that you already know how to do? That doesn't take a whole lot of faith, right? You just do it because you've got the talent to do it. But when God calls you to do something that, be, that is beyond your comfort zone and level and ability, then we're talking faith because you're dealing with something that you can't see. So the first thing we need to grasp from this part of the definition of faith is, if you can see it, then it's not faith. And the second is, if it's not real, then it's not faith. Uh, there's a second part uh, that, th this second part is so important for us to grasp. If it's not real, then it's not faith. Or at least it's not true biblical faith. It may be blind faith or some other kind of faith, but it's certainly not what the Bible means by faith. In other words, biblical faith is not being certain about non-realities that you cannot see, but only those things which are true and actual which you cannot see. Uh, let me give you some examples. If you, know, if you are, have faith that you're going to win the lottery this week, the Mega Millions or the Powerball, because it's over 500 million, and even though the odds of winning are 350 to 1, um, you say, I'm going to win. You know, you have faith that you're going to win. Well, that's really a, a fantasy. That's not, that's, that's not a reality. Or if you say, I believe in fairies, that's not, you know, biblical faith. Fairies don't exist. Uh, if you believe in a false religion or an idol and you have faith in that idol, that's not genuine biblical faith because those things are not real. It's, if it's not real, then it's not true biblical faith. 
Faith refers to present and future realities, things that are real that you cannot see. Okay? So that's our, our core definition of faith. It's being uh, confident in what we hope for and having assurance, certainty, about what we do not see. But we know the things that we do not see are real, and, and so we trust in them. This uh, also tells us, this, these first couple of verses, that faith is what the Old Testament believers were commended for. Um, and and uh, that's important, that uh, the ancients uh, were our, our forefathers uh, in the faith. Now, those we read about in the Old Testament, the stories of the Old Testament are not just historical accounts of things that happened back then in the past. They, they're that, they are that, but there's so much more. And we read in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, that these things occurred as examples for us. And just as the stories in the Old Testament are, are meant to be examples for us, so also the people of the Old Testament are meant to serve as examples. And here in the book of Hebrews, uh, it points specifically to their faith. Hebrews 11.2 says, This is what the ancients were commended for. What is this? Uh, this is what they were commended for. Well, it's their faith. It's their deep conviction in their hearts to believe in unseen realities, both present and future. It is their conviction and assurance in God that produced in them an unshakable hope in God and his promises. The word commended here is a word that means to give a good report. So it's report card time for the Old Testament believers here in Hebrews 11. Let's pull out their report cards and see how they did. Well, when you look at the report cards of the people in the Old Testament, you quickly discover that they, they didn't do so well in a whole lot of areas. I mean, think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all failed miserably in the whole area of honesty. Moses flunked speech, and he didn't do very well in the temper department either. King David failed when it came to sexual purity. Uh, no, when you read through the Old Testament, you don't find many persons who receive straight A's when it comes to the report card of their lives. They all had so many failures and flaws. So what are they commended for here? What is this good report that we hear about in Hebrews 2? That you know, This is what the ancients were commended for. Well, the good report is rewarded is awarded to them in one area and one area only, the subject area of faith. This is what the ancients were commended for, not for living perfect lives. No, they were commended for their faith, for being sure of what they hoped for, uncertain of what they did not see. They believed God, even when they couldn't see the answer, and their faith was credited to them as righteousness. Once again, the righteous will live by faith. And then the rest of Hebrews 11 is simply a running commentary on these two verses. In the remaining verses of this chapter, the writer of Hebrews will take us through the, old, the whole Old Testament, you know, in a nutshell, starting with creation, demonstrating how all these Old Testament believers exercised true biblical faith and how that faith benefited their lives in the kingdom of God. Now, I want to finish today by looking at verse 3 because I think this gives us a, a clue about what faith is based on. Faith is based on the Word of God. If true biblical faith deals with realities that we cannot see, how do we know what is real and what is not? How do we know what to believe in? Well, verse 3 points us to the answer. True faith is always based on the Word of God. For example, the Bible tells us that saving faith is based on the Word of God. This is what Romans 10, 17 says. Faith comes by hearing and uh, hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. If it were not for the word of God, you could not have saving faith in Jesus Christ. You would know from history that a man named Jesus existed, that he lived about 2,000 years ago. You'd know that he performed many miracles, and that he was hailed by the people as a prophet. You would know that he was crucified and then seen alive again, but you would not know what any of that means. All of those truths about Jesus can be gleaned from extra-biblical sources. It is only when we read or hear the Word of God that we understand that Jesus is the Son of God who died to pay the penalty for our sins. It is through the Word of God that we are told the, uh, the unseen reality behind the historical events. And now we can exercise faith in Christ and be saved. True faith is always based on the Word of God. 
That is how we know uh, the reality of things unseen, because our faith is based on the absolute certainty of God's word. Now, verse 3 tells us that by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So we need to understand the power of God's word in creation. How do you know that you can trust God's word? Well, you begin with creation. Do you want to grow your, in your faith as a Christian? Then first of all, understand the power of God's word in creation. Understand that God created the whole world out of nothing by the power of his word. Look again at verse thir- 3. Uh, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Those two words, by faith, compose the refrain of our whole chapter. Nineteen times in Hebrews 11 we read these two little words, by faith. They may be small words, but they represent giant accomplishments, giant works of God in the lives of Old Testament believers. This first section deals with the creation of the world. By faith we understand that God created the universe out of nothing by the power of his word. That means he did not need to use uh, any pre-existing material. That which is seen, the physical world, the entire universe as we know it, was created out of absolutely nothing. Hebrews 11.3 says that we understand this by faith since no one was there to see it. God's creation of the world out of nothing by the power of his word is an unseen reality which we really only know because God has told us about it. Once again, faith is always a response to God's word. And so we understand this creation event by faith. God spoke and it happened. At first there was nothing uh, but God. But then he spoke and the universe came into being by the power of his word. So how do we know this is true? Did God really create the world out of nothing by the power of his word? We may not have been around to witness the creation of the world, but God has given us some strong confirmations concerning truth that we have just learned from Hebrews 11.3. The Bible confirms that God created the world world, uh, by his spoken word. If you read through Genesis 1, one of the recurring frames you'll see there is God said, God said, God said, let there be light. And then, uh, you know, it happened. God said, let us create man in our own image. And then it happened. Uh, so it was the God's word as he spoke and God said. So the Bible confirms that God spoke the world into existence. And nature confirms the power of, of God's word. The Bible, uh, you know, says it, but also nature does. Romans 1.20 says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So nature, you know, proclaims the glory of God. Um, Creation itself testifies to God's eternal power and divine nature. The vastness of creation is a testimony of God's infinite power. The detailed order and intricacies of the universe bear testimony of God's divine nature. Everywhere you look in nature, you see intelligence, purpose, and design. So the Bible confirms it, nature confirms it, and science confirms it. One of the axioms of science has been that in the physical world, nothing comes from nothing. All matter matter and energy are conserved. So scientists who do not believe in God have a problem. If nothing comes from nothing, then where did everything come from? Uh, For the longest time, these uh, scientists that don't believe in God believed in an eternal universe, that matter always existed. Well, this idea of an eternal universe may have worked fine for a while, But guess what scientists have discovered the more they examine the universe? They've discovered that everything in the universe points to the fact that it did have a beginning. All the evidence demonstrates that the universe is not eternal, but that it began at some point in time. This means that matter is not eternal, but came from somewhere, and science cannot explain it. Science can do a lot of things, but it cannot explain how something came from nothing. These, uh, si- those scientists who do believe in God, however, understand that God created the physical world and all of its properties out of nothing. In fact, the knowledge that God created the world is what prompted scientific inquiry to begin with. Scientists reasoned 
If God created an orderly world, then we can study God's world and find the order and wisdom behind it. Science was birthed from a Christian worldview. The pagan religions did not produce modern science. Christianity did. So we need to learn to trust God's promises. Okay, If faith is based on God's word, then we need to trust God's promises. One of the ways God's word functions in our lives as believers is through the promises of God. As Christians, we need to learn to trust God's promises. If God says something, then we know it's true. It's impossible for God to lie. If God promises something, then that promise is certain. Numbers 23, 19 tells us, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? The Bible is full of God's promises to you and me as believers. And when God makes us a promise, you may trust God to fulfill it. Remember that faith is our response based on God's word. God's word tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. We believe it. God's word tells us that Jesus is a supreme high priest who sacrificed himself on the cross, paying the penalty for our sin, and that he has ascended to heaven and intercedes for us, and that he has made the way possible for us to enter into God's very presence uh, to find grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. So we believe it. God's word tells us we have faith and we believe it. God spoke and the whole world came into being. That is ultimate power. And if God can do that, then he can easily fulfill all the rest of his promises in Scripture. So here is our definition of faith that we have just talked about. Being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And it's based on God's word because God has revealed himself to us and we have faith in what God has revealed to us because God has revealed to us unseen realities. It's not fiction, it's not fantasy, but it's unseen realities that provides a hope that is a uh, firm and secure anchor for our souls. And so we choose to trust in him and put our faith and trust in him based on what we have learned from God's word. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today, and we thank you for this, uh, you know, um, definition that we've been talking about, of what, about what faith is, being certain uh, of what we hope for and uh, sure of what we cannot see. And thank you, Lord, that, you know, we know these things are real because you have revealed them to us in your word. And your word is a powerful world, as we just talked about. You spoke and the world came into being. It's a powerful word. And so uh, we can trust it. And uh, we can build our lives upon it. We can be, have faith in what your word reveals to us, that Jesus is our Savior. And we proclaim our faith and trust in him today. And Father, I, uh, I pray for us now as we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper. I pray, Father, that... Um, you would just speak to our hearts and minds by your spirit if there's sin in our life that we need to confess and repent of before we partake of uh, communion today would you reveal that to us and uh, if not then uh, lord may we just rejoice in the blessings that you have given to us and and in your word and so let's just take a moment in silent prayer uh, to talk with god Thank you for the promise in your word that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And thank you for our salvation in Christ. Thank you that Jesus is the great high priest who sacrificed himself if, uh, so that our sins could be forgiven. And uh, Lord, we thank you for that. And as we partake of the Lord's Supper today, we continue to proclaim by faith our trust in what Jesus has done for us in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for this uh, simple reminder that Jesus' body was uh, nailed to that cross for us, that his blood was shed for us. And uh, Lord, we ask your blessing on the bread and the cup now. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and take the bread that you set aside. 
And uh, let me just speak the words that Jesus spoke prior to that first uh, communion opportunity with the disciples. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Well, thank you again for joining me this week. Let me share a benediction with you. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. In Jesus' name, amen.